Open Your Mind to Prosperity by Catherine Ponder Chapter 1 Open Your Mind for Prosperity I declared war on poverty when I was still in the first grade. We lived in a poverty-stricken area of the South, and most of the children in my school had neither adequate lunches nor enough clothes. When my mother gave me lunch money, I just gave it away. Upon learning what I was doing, she began preparing my lunches. This made me very happy. It meant I could step up my war on poverty as I broke up sandwiches and passed them out to my classmates. Mother never was able to stop me from giving away my lunches. But when I started giving away my clothes she objected strongly. Finally she said, we cannot afford to clothe the entire neighborhood, though we almost have this winter, thanks to you. I'm going to buy you one more coat, and you'd better not give it away. One cold winter day I arrived home from school, obediently wearing that winter coat, but barefooted. I had just given away my shoes and socks. It was not until years later that I learned how to wage war on poverty in such a way that I did not have to give away my lunches, my shoes, or my socks. A Wall Street economist recently gave his formula for a cure for poverty. What is needed is not so much a war on poverty as an understanding of the forces that generate prosperity. The forces that generate prosperity are mental and spiritual. In order to conduct a mental and spiritual war on poverty, the first thing you must do is open your mind to prosperity. I came upon this great truth quite by accident. I was a minister in Birmingham, Alabama, when the worst recession since World War II hit this country. Birmingham is an industrial city. During that recession, it was so hard hit economically that thousands of people were out of work. There were bread lines, everyone was talking depression, hard times, and lack. Finally the government declared the city a disaster area, making federal aid available. It was during that trying period that the people in my church asked me to teach a class that would point out the mental and spiritual laws of prosperity. I soon discovered something significant. Even though the people in that class desperately needed to be prospered, most of them had the old, erroneous idea that it was sinful to be prosperous. They felt guilty about even coming to the prosperity class. Since that time I have discovered that there is nothing unusual in this attitude. Most people with financial problems have a psychological block about prosperity. They have been taught in the past that poverty is a Christian virtue, and that to be prosperous is somehow wicked. They have been taught that anyone who is prosperous is probably a crook and therefore subject to suspicion. In any event, he is a sinner. How in the world can poverty be a Christian virtue? when poverty causes most of the world's problems. It is as though the soul of man were rioting against lack in this enlightened age, because the soul intuitively knows that man is supposed to be prosperous. You can open your mind to prosperity by giving up that ridiculous idea that poverty is a Christian virtue, when it is nothing but a common vice. Poverty is definitely a sin, not a blessing. As Charles Fillmore has declared in his book Prosperity, the Father's desire for us is unlimited good, not merely the means of a meager existence. We cannot be very happy if we are poor, and nobody needs to be poor. It is a sin to be poor. There is nothing new about this idea. A century ago a Baptist minister named Dr. Russell Conwell became very famous because of one lecture, called Acres of Diamonds, which he gave all over the United States. Dr. Conwell made somewhere between $8 million and $12 million as he traveled about, over a 50-year period, giving that one lecture, the proceeds of which he used to found Temple University in Philadelphia. As you study his famous prosperity lecture, you discover that he was trying to break down the listener's sense of guilt about becoming prosperous, I say you ought to be rich. You have no right to be poor. To live and not be rich is a misfortune and it is doubly a misfortune because you could have been rich just as well as being poor. You can open your mind to prosperity when you realize that through your study and application of the mental and spiritual laws of prosperity, you are not trying to make God give you anything. As the Bible promises, all things are yours. In the beginning, God created a lavish universe, and then created spiritual man and placed him in this world of abundance, giving him dominion over it. You are only trying to open your mind to receive your heritage of abundance bequeathed you from the beginning.
you can begin opening your mind to this abundance by declaring often, I am the rich child of a loving father, so I dare to prosper. There once was a businessman who had his own simple formula for opening his mind to prosperity. When people asked, how's business? He had a standard reply, regardless of economic conditions of the moment, business is wonderful, because there's gold dust in the air. It always seemed so for that man. No matter what people about him were doing or saying, he prospered. His friends would say, I don't understand it. Everything he touches turns to gold. In that first prosperity class in 1958, and in scores of classes I have conducted since that time, I have observed that as soon as people realize it is spiritually right, rather than spiritually wrong, for them to be prosperous, it is as though the windows of heaven were open to them. Recent reports from people who opened their minds to prosperity include these, a businesswoman doubled her financial income and then happily married a man of affluence, after having been widowed for 10 years. A housewife accepted this great idea, and soon learned that her husband had just inherited a large portion of the company for which he worked. Another housewife watched her husband progress from one promotion to another in his engineering job. They inherited money bought a new home and two new cars, and after having tried for a number of years were able to adopt several children. A young college professor obtained another degree and went on to a fine job at a much larger income at a state university. A domestic worker demonstrated a six-week trip to Europe. A teacher was transferred out of an inharmonious department in her school, to a far more congenial teaching position. One couple was able to buy a beautiful new home with no down payment. The former owner gave them his $8,000 equity, one couple's two children both obtained college scholarships. A woman in the real estate business got her broker's license and went into business for herself, another realtor made her first sale in a year. Upon returning home from a prosperity lecture in Oklahoma City, a businesswoman answered her ringing telephone. It was a customer with a $40 sale, at 12.30 p.m. on a Sunday. The next morning she was awakened by another ringing telephone, and another sale. This was quite a change from the hard sell approach to which she was accustomed. A businessman walked out of a prosperity lecture, and on the way to his car found a $20 bill. Later that week, a raise he had been trying for months to obtain for his employees came through. After opening her mind to prosperity, a young widow was able to reduce her debts by $1,700 within three days. You can open your mind to prosperity when you realize it pays to do so, right in the face of lack and limitation. I started writing prosperity articles a decade ago, when I was living in one room. I felt foolish writing about prosperity, telling other people how to be prosperous, when I was living in just one room. But I realize that I must do something to open my mind to prosperity in order to get out of that room. It took me three years, but when I finally moved out, I found a lovely new home. The move could have come sooner, had I known the complete prosperity formula given in this book. Opening your mind to prosperity in the face of lack can have dramatic effects on your life, too. This was brought to my attention by those around me while I was writing my first book. After typing the first half of the manuscript, my secretary resigned. She explained that as she had typed the manuscript she had used the ideas in it, and her husband had been prospered so much in his sales work that she no longer needed the job. A second secretary was then employed to type the last half of the book. Before completing it, she also resigned. She explained that her husband had been out of work when she took the job but that he now had the finest engineering job of his life, one which would take him to another state. She felt that the ideas in the book had turned the tide. Finally, my housekeeper resigned. She had not seen the manuscript, but I had explained the laws of prosperity to her while writing about them, chapter by chapter. As she opened her mind to prosperity, she decided to do something she had long wished to do but had never quite had the courage, become a dressmaker. She has prospered in that field of work ever since. It was startling to lose two secretaries and a housekeeper while writing one book, just because they dared to open their minds. You can open your mind to prosperity when you realize the true definition of the word, you are prosperous to the degree that you are experiencing peace, health, and plenty in your world. 
prosperity includes peace of mind, a businessman recently wrote, the study of prosperity certainly does bring peace of mind. Since I took up this study, my wife has stopped griping at me, and my mother-in-law has started leaving me alone. A young musician who attended one of my prosperity classes had been out of work for a number of months. Immediately after the class, he got the finest job of his life. Later he wrote, I had a nice surprise from my study. I took it up because I needed a job, which I quickly got. But at the time I employed prosperous thinking, my wife and I were estranged. We have now been reconciled and are happier than ever. Prosperity certainly includes peace and harmony. Prosperity includes health. A housewife was taken by her husband to a prosperity lecture. This woman had been in pain for 12 years from a chronic ailment which drugs could temporarily alleviate but could not cure. When the drugs wore off, the pain returned. On the way home from the lecture that night, she realized that for the first time in 12 years she was free of pain without using drugs. That was eight years ago. The pain has never returned. This couple has gone on to financial success also, but their main prosperity demonstration was a physical healing. Prosperity includes financial plenty, people sometimes reflect, since prosperity includes peace and health, prosperity is more than money alone. True, but what's wrong with prosperity as money? An important way to open your mind to prosperity is deliberately to open your mind to the idea that money is spiritual, that money is a part of your spiritual heritage. There are millionaires in the Bible. It helps in opening your mind to prosperity when you realize that the great spiritual leaders of the Bible were prosperous people, many of them were literally millionaires. They seem to know that prosperity was a spiritual blessing and poverty was a curse. In the first book of the Bible, we find four millionaires among the great Hebrew leaders, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The Bible vividly describes their wealth. We have often thought of Abraham as the father of the Hebrew people, which he was called, but he was also a millionaire. The scriptures declare that his substance was very great, and that the Lord blessed him in all things. When I first mentioned in a lecture that Abraham was a millionaire, a startled Texan asked, if Abraham was a millionaire, how many oil wells did he have? I replied, I don't know, but I'll find out. When I checked the biblical description of Abraham's wealth, I could not locate a single oil well for him. But as I studied carefully the passages describing his wealth, one verse stood out, Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. When I happily reported to that skeptical Texan that Abraham had been a rich cattleman, he was so impressed that he decided that the wells which Isaac, another of the Bible's early millionaires, kept digging were oil wells. Somehow there never seemed a proper time for me to explain to him that those wells of Isaac's were mere water wells, which were even more priceless than oil wells in that arid part of the world. The Bible is a prosperity textbook you can open your mind to prosperity when you realize that the Bible is the greatest prosperity textbook ever written, and begin studying it from that standpoint. The Bible is filled with stories about bread and fish. This is marvelous prosperity symbolism, the bread symbolizes the substance of the universe, which we mold and shape with our thoughts and words of prosperity. The fish symbolize ideas of increase. The word gold appears more than 400 times in the Bible. There are between 3,000 and 4,000 promises in the Bible, many of them literal prosperity promises. Jesus' interest in prosperity is shown in the Lord's Prayer, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Many of Jesus' miracles were prosperity miracles, and many of his parables were prosperity parables. When Jesus said of the rich young ruler, how hard it will be for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom, it was because he knew that this rich man was possessed by his possessions rather than controlling them. A spiritual consciousness of prosperity gives you control over your possessions, rather than allowing your possessions to control you. Prosperity, a necessity for your growth You can open your mind to prosperity when you realize that prosperity is a necessity for your spiritual growth because prosperity gives you freedom to unfold spiritually. Recently I sat next to a doctor of chiropractic at a banquet where we were both guest speakers. 
This man told me how much the mental and spiritual approaches to prosperity had meant to him over the years. He described how he had gone from being a struggling young doctor who had nothing, to being a happy, affluent one who now has his own clinic, a large practice, a nice home, a fine family, cars, investments, property, even a private plane. He said this, I am a far better doctor, a far better husband and parent, a far better citizen today because I am prosperous. I now have time to study truth, to unfold spiritually in a way I never had before. Everybody ought to be prosperous, because prosperity gives them freedom. Prosperity is a necessity for spiritual growth. Prosperity has a spiritual basis you can open your mind to prosperity by following Moses' advice to the Hebrews centuries ago, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. This is the prosperity secret of the ages, God is the source of your supply. As long as you relate to the source, you will be prosperous. It is when you turn from God as the source and depend upon people and conditions for your prosperity that you have financial problems. People and conditions are channels of your supply, to be sure, but God is the source. Knowing this, you do not panic if the channel changes, but know to look to God as the source for guidance and supply, I do not depend upon persons or conditions for my prosperity. God is the source of my prosperity and provides his own channels of supply for me now. Many years ago, when it seemed that people and conditions controlled my good, I found this passage in Lessons in Truth helpful, no person or thing in the universe, no chain of circumstances, can by any possibility interpose itself between you and all joy, all good. You may think that something stands between you and your heart's desire, and so live with that desire unfulfilled, but it is not true. Deny it, and you will find yourself free. Then you will see the good flowing, too, you, and you will see clearly that nothing can stand between you and your own. The statements I used at that time to help free me from the belief in personality's power to withhold my good, and to help me relate to God as the source of my supply, were these, I clearly see that nothing or no one can stand between me and my own. I dissolve in my own mind and in the minds of all others any idea that my own can be withheld from me. That which is for my highest good now comes to me, and in my clear perception of truth I welcome it. Nothing can oppose my good. No one can oppose my good. I now accomplish great things with ease. Refusing to criticize another's prosperity, I turn to God, ask His direction, and I am prospered. Love envieth not. The prospering truth now sets me free. My life cannot be limited. My financial income, cannot be limited. Christ in me now frees me from all limitation. I am rich in mind and manifestation now. The forgiving love of Jesus Christ now sets me free from all financial mistakes of the past or present. I face the future wise, free, and unafraid. The Bible plainly shows that as long as the Hebrews recognized God as the source of their supply and looked to Him for guidance, they prospered lavishly. It was when they turned from God and began to look to people and conditions for supply, during the time of Solomon, that the Hebrew nation divided financially and politically and went into exile. This attitude is practical perhaps you are wondering, but just how practical is this idea of looking to God as the source of my supply? Another doctor said to me recently, I never really prospered, though I worked hard trying, until I learned that prosperity has a spiritual basis. After I began to affirm daily that God was the source of my supply, that I did not have to depend upon my patients or upon other people or upon economic conditions for my prosperity, I was able to build a new $100,000 clinic for my patients within eight months. He showed me pictures of his clinic and it is truly beautiful. This is a practical idea, that God is the source of your prosperity and that your prosperity has a spiritual basis. When you open your mind to this freeing idea, you will begin to prosper. You may be thinking, yes, but I know people who are not religious but are exceedingly prosperous. They do not recognize God as the source of their supply. Perhaps they are prosperous in a financial sense. But remember that true prosperity includes peace and health. What about their peace of mind and health of body? Chapter 2 Cleanse Your Mind for Prosperity Cleansing, or Purification, is the first step in prosperity. 
If people around the world knew the cleansing steps to prosperity and used them, they would revolutionize their lives for good. The mystics had a three-point formula for success. 1. Purification, or cleansing. 2. Illumination, or getting guidance on how to be prospered. 3. Union with God and His good. These three steps to success are covered in this and the following chapters. The Bible is filled with cleansing symbolism, sacrifice, renunciation, repentance. Even the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem is symbolic of the letting go of negative emotions that is necessary before prosperity can come. The ancient Greeks observed rites of purification, and so must we. Life is a constant purification process. If you try to bypass this cleansing process in your thoughts and feelings, you bypass your good, because you have not cleaned out your mind and emotions to receive the good you want. Dr. Evelyn Underbill has explained, in her book The Mount of Purification, the cleansing process forms a large part of our spiritual life. It is our own fault if we do not get purified in this life. You must get rid of what you do not want, to make way for what you do want. Substance, gold dust. Mind power, does not flow easily into a cluttered, crowded situation. Substance does not flow easily into a cluttered, crowded mind. Substance does not flow easily into a cluttered, crowded, hate-filled emotional state. You must begin to form a vacuum, in both outer and inner ways. Magnetic influences are transmitted perfectly through a vacuum. By forming a vacuum, you become magnetic to your good. I have seen it happen hundreds of times. Get rid of what you do not want in an outer way. Clean up, clean out the closets, desk drawers, house, car, office. Forming a vacuum in an outer way makes a believer out of your subconscious mind, which then goes to work in inner ways to manifest greater prosperity for you. There has to be a release of the old to make way for the new. You can unblock your good by forming a vacuum. A woman in Chicago heard about this vacuum law at a lecture one night and decided to stay home from work the next day and clean out closets and drawers. Nothing happened when she cleaned out closets, but when she cleaned out dresser drawers she found $30 she had tucked away and forgotten. Another woman formed vacuum by cleaning out her pocketbooks. In one, she found $40 she had forgotten. A housewife formed a vacuum by getting rid of old, mismatched sheets in her linen closet. The next day, she received as a gift several new sets of sheets and pillowcases. But nothing happened until a vacuum had been formed to receive them. A marvelous statement to use as you form a vacuum is, I now let go worn out things, worn out conditions, and worn out relationships. Divine order is now established and maintained in me and in my world. Prosperity comes quickly when a vacuum is formed. A musician in Southern California recently learned of the vacuum law of prosperity and decided to invoke it by cleaning out his closet. Within 24 hours, three things happened, since he was a public school music teacher, he needed a summer job. As he cleaned out his closet, he got an idea for conducting music workshops in the summer sessions of colleges and universities. He made a telephone call to his New York agent, who liked the idea so much that within a matter of hours the agent had him booked at leading universities all over the United States at an interesting income. The second thing that happened was that another music teacher called him and said, I'm getting more calls for freelance, evening and weekend, work than I can handle. May I refer my overflow calls to you? This would give him a year-round second income, right in his own neighborhood. The next morning after cleaning out his closet, he started driving to work on one of the famous California freeways. Along the way he spied a stalled car. Ordinarily he would have hurried on, but intuitively he felt guided to stop and offer assistance. The owner of the stalled car was a woman wearing a white uniform. Upon examining her car, he said, I believe the engine is only overheated. I'll wait with you a few minutes and, if it doesn't start, I'll drive you to the nearest service station where you can get help. Noting the white uniform, he asked, Do you do domestic work? Yes, was the reply. Do you have any days available? He queried. Yes, I have every other Thursday. Good. If you'll come and work for my wife, you're hired. The teacher explained that for months they had tried to find help. Later he exclaimed excitedly, 
If all this happened just by cleaning out the closet, I can hardly wait to see what will happen when I clean out the garage. Give up the expensive, even the new in forming an outer vacuum. It is wise to give up the expensive as well as the inexpensive, if the expensive items involved are no longer of use to you. I once had two lovely velvet suits which I hesitated to give up because they carried expensive labels. But every time I looked at them hanging there, I realized that they no longer fit me and were useless to me. Finally I decided to give them up, even though they were expensive. Within less than a week, I received a letter from my sister saying, I have a lovely velvet suit which I bought by Labrod. It is by far the most expensive garment I've ever owned, but I do not wear it. I am mailing it to you in the hope that you can use it in your lecture work. Could I? It arrived just in time to accompany me on my next trip, and its color even matched the auditorium in which I spoke. Furthermore, it was even more expensive than the suits I had just given away. That experience taught me that by giving up the expensive, one makes way for something even more beautiful to come, without financial stress. Dr. Ernest Wilson wrote the explanation for this. All of our loosing is not simply the loosing of so-called evil. We must loose forms of the good as well. Good is seldom static. It is progressive. It evolves. It changes. We must allow it to be so. We must loose accustomed forms of good, when our progress or that of someone else involved demands it. We must not be afraid to trust that law that brought the good to bring another that shall fulfill it. We must be willing to let angels go that archangels may come into our life. Loose your good, hold it gently, free it readily. Sometimes it is something new we need to release. Have you ever bought something on impulse, only to realize later that you did not need it? If so, instead of condemning yourself for having shopped impulsively, return it or otherwise dispose of it. As you release it, you make way for the equivalent good to find its way to you. I recently bought a dinner dress on impulse, only to realize later that it was not right for me. Soon after passing it on to someone who delighted in it, my personal shopper called to say that she had just received in stock several dinner dresses that seemed exactly right for me. Upon inspecting them, I found one that easily took the place of the one I had released and was far more suitable. A businessman recently said to me, it also pays to get rid of that which doesn't work. I had long been haunted by a certain health problem which didn't clear up. One day I decided to form a vacuum by throwing out my medicine. I have not had an attack since. Cleansing through order you can cleanse your mind for prosperity by getting things in order generally. As you do so, affirm divine order. God does not violate the orderly arrangement of events. Instead, he seems to withhold the next development until order is first established in the present situation in the present state of mind. A college professor's car was hit by a car driven by one of his students. The latter's insurance company did not properly respond to the claim. For two months this case dragged on, until the professor realized he had not affirmed divine order. When he got quiet and did so, he called again for another appointment with the insurance adjuster. This time the papers were ready for his signature, and a check was forthcoming. Emerson spoke of sublime order rather than divine order. He wrote of man throwing himself joyfully into the sublime order. A good affirmation for this is, I am in divine order. I am in sublime order now. When things seem inharmonious and out of order, instead of rushing about frantically trying to make them right in an outer way, instead of trying to change other people and make them more orderly, remind yourself that lack of order first exists within you. If you can get your own thoughts and feelings orderly, the people, situations, and even the universe about you will respond in a more orderly way. Two women were driving in a heavy rainstorm, when one of them remembered to affirm divine order. Quickly the fog lifted, the rain stopped, and they drove into clear weather. Declare often, the inflow and outflow of everything in my life is established in divine order. I am peaceful and poised make your elimination list you can cleanse your mind for prosperity by writing out what you want eliminated from your life. For many years I had made lists of what I wanted to manifest in my life. But one nagging problem did not clear up, and one could not understand why. 
Finally I read a little booklet which suggested that you write out what you want to eliminate from your life first, and then list what you want to manifest. This, said the booklet, was the way to alter your life. I tried this suggestion and it worked. In fact, it was amazing how quickly that nagging problem disappeared from my life, after I had battled with it for years, when I dared to write down that I wanted that problem eliminated. The function of elimination is twofold, to eliminate error, and to expand your good. Elimination of something from your life is always an indication that something better is on the way. After writing about what you want eliminated, it is good to declare, I let go and trust. When you are trying to achieve a result and it has not come, it is often because there is still something in mind, body, affairs, or relationships that you need to renounce, free, release, or eliminate. As long as you put off this elimination process, you put off results. Every phase of life requires renunciation. Every advance means the rejection of something old. But elimination not only takes something from you, it gives something to you. A businessman in Detroit said skeptically, how does my subconscious mind know what to eliminate? It may eliminate the wrong thing. The subconscious mind does not know. But the superconscious, or Christ mind, does know what to eliminate and will work through both the conscious and subconscious activities of mind to properly eliminate from your world that which should be eliminated, when you call on the Christ consciousness to do so. This you can do through using decrees that declare the all-intelligent Christ mind is doing the eliminating, Christ in me is my releasing power. Christ in me is my freeing power. Christ in me now frees me from all resentment or attachment toward or from people, places, or things of the past or present. I now release everything and everybody of the past or present that are no longer part of the divine plan for my life. Christ in me manifests my true place with the true people and the true prosperity now. I once used these statements of release at a time when I felt general dissatisfaction in my life but did not know what needed to be released. Shortly I was offered a lovely apartment, in a complex where I had long wished to live. With the move came the release of old furniture and personal effects, from which I had wanted freedom. The new surroundings gave me a new lease on life. Though I had not realized I needed the change and could have it just then, the Christ mind had known it and arranged it when I used the foregoing statements of release. Divine intelligence always knows what to do, and responds when we call on it. Clean out your life along with cleaning out the closets, you must also clean out your life, if you wish to cleanse your mind for prosperity. If you want to be prospered, be healed, and have your prayers answered, you must clean up and clean out your life. It is useless to affirm benefits, protection, supply, guidance, and healing, if all the time you are doing things which you know are not right in the sight of God. So often, when one first learns of the power of thought, he thinks he can use mind power to force other people to do what he wants them to do. He tries to plaster over his life with affirmations. He may even get temporary results. But those results will only be temporary unless they have been founded upon the right basis. A lonely widow had led a life of emotional and moral compromise since the death of her husband, feeling that she had to settle for such an arrangement. Finally she realized that if she wished to remarry, she must clean up and clean out her life. It took at least six months to clear out various compromising relationships, but after she did there was a quiet period of trusting in God to show her the way. Within a year she happily married a fine man, whom she would not have met had she continued in her previous circle of acquaintances. It is true that God, as law, withholds the next development until order is first established in the present situation. This woman proved that elimination is twofold, and that when she eliminated error from her life, the expanded good came. For freedom in your relationships declare. Christ in me now frees me from everything and everybody that are no longer part of the divine plan for my life. Everything and everybody that are no longer a part of the divine plan for my life now release me. Christ in me reveals, unfolds, and manifests the divine plan of my life now. Cleanse your mind through forgiveness Cleanse your mind for prosperity by practicing forgiveness. Many people are never permanently prospered, no matter what else they do because they are holding grudges and negative feelings toward others. Until they get down to business and forgive, 
their prosperity does not come. The word forgive means simply to give up. Forgiveness is not an unpleasant, dramatic outer act in which you say I am sorry when you are not. Instead, forgiveness is a pleasant inner act that leaves you at peace with yourself and others. It is good to give yourself a universal forgiveness treatment every day. This keeps your mind and emotions cleared of negative feelings that could block your good, all that has offended me, I forgive. Within and without, I forgive. Things past, things present, things future I forgive. I forgive everything and everybody who can possibly need forgiveness in my past and present. I forgive positively everyone. I am free, and all others are free, too. All things are cleared up between us, now and forever. A school teacher had had a nervous breakdown, and her employer had told her she would never teach in his school system again. Even when her doctor finally approved her to return to work, her employer refused to place her. She and her husband had several children who would soon need to go to college. They also needed a larger home and a second car. This woman felt it imperative that she teach again. When she learned of the prospering power of forgiveness, she realized that much ill feeling existed between her and her employer, and that forgiveness might be blocking her good. With a friend, she sat one afternoon and spoke words of forgiveness to her employer, Christ in you is your forgiving power. Christ in you is your releasing power. Christ in me in my forgiving power. Christ in me is my releasing power. Christ in me is my prospering power now. Soon it she learned that her employer had decided to go abroad for a year's study. The man who replaced him gladly employed her for substitute teaching again. When you hold resentment towards someone or something, you are bound to that person or condition by an emotional link that is stronger than steel. The practice of forgiveness is the only way to dissolve that link and be free. A businessman was delayed at the airport by bad weather reports. It was imperative that he make certain plain connections for an important business conference. Realizing that resentment blocks one's good, and that on the way to the airport he had been thinking resentfully of a competitor, he sat quietly in the waiting room and mentally said to his competitor, There is no competition in Christ, and there is no competition between us. The forgiving love of Jesus Christ forgives and releases any ill feeling between us, now and forever. We both go free to prosper. Shortly he was informed by airline employees that the weather was clearing and a plane had arrived which would take him to his destination on time. It was as though his thoughts of resentment toward his competitor had literally held him at the airport until he forgave the other man. Since the word forgive simply means to give up, often the greatest way you can forgive others is simply to give up all ill thoughts about them, as well as all outer contact with them. Forgiveness is a constant process. Whenever there is a block to my good, I ask, Father, whom do I need to forgive? What experience or condition do I need to forgive? One person knowing and declaring words of forgiveness for everyone and everything in a situation can dissolve the problem, regardless of what others are doing or saying. A woman attended a lecture on forgiveness and mentally spoke words of forgiveness to her husband, who had deserted her more than a decade before. She had not heard from him since. Within 24 hours, he telephoned her long distance, asking to see her again. A noted marriage counselor has said that a good marriage requires a lot of forgiveness. We might paraphrase that and say that a good life requires a lot of forgiveness. A disgruntled businesswoman attended a lecture on forgiveness, and at the close she said, I feel great. I have just forgiven everyone I know. The lecturer suggested she continue speaking forth words of forgiveness each day since forgiveness is a constant process. A few weeks later the woman returned and said, I have been practicing forgiveness and I feel terrible. I just didn't know I hated so many people. If people daily practiced forgiveness, they would probably put most doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and loan companies out of business, because everyone would become healthy and prosperous. How to get others to forgive you along with declaring that you forgive other people, declare that they also forgive you, because subconsciously they want to, whether they realize it or not. Everyone wants to be free of negative emotions, whether he consciously admits it or not. Declare for others, the Christ in you forgives and frees me. All things are cleared up between us now and forever.
a mother had had a hectic time with her adolescent daughter, who finally eloped. The mother emotionally released her daughter, and declared that the daughter forgave her for all ill feeling between them. For some time it did not seem so, but she continued declaring it. In due time they developed a closer, freer relationship than ever before, but with freedom for all concerned. About a year ago, in morning meditation, the name of a fellow worker kept coming to me and I had an uncomfortable feeling about him. Several months previously I had suggested a certain project to which he had objected, so I had dropped it. Each morning his name kept coming into my prayer time. I tried to dismiss it but continued to get an uncomfortable, unhappy feeling about him. Finally I realized that perhaps there was a need of forgiveness between us, though I consciously held no ill will. When I spoke words of forgiveness to him, nothing changed. But when I began declaring that he forgave me, I felt the uncomfortable, unhappy feeling begin to pass away. Within three or four morning prayer sessions, the feeling had cleared up completely. A couple of weeks later, that worker contacted me and suggested that we go ahead with the project I had recommended several months previously. We did, and it proved to be one of the most successful we had ever carried out. How to give and receive emotional release A fine formula is to forgive your enemies and release your friends. Forgive the people you hate or resent. Release the people you love. Loose your loved ones and let them go to their good. This may be the very thing you do not want to do. You feel that they need your encouragement, help, and understanding. But when you attempt to help them by keeping a possessive hold on them, they chafe so under your restraint that they are not free to love you as they otherwise would, and problems develop between you. Remember this about release, you never lose anything that still belongs to you by divine right, through the act of emotional release. Instead, you make way for your good to manifest in grander ways than ever before. Possessive, dominating people have all kinds of problems. Also, people who let themselves be possessed by others have all kinds of problems. There is a simple way to get and give freedom from possessiveness and domination, and that is simply by speaking words of release, Christ in me now frees me from all attachment toward or from people, places, or things of the past or present. Christ in me is my releasing power now. For others toward you, Christ in you now frees you from all attachment toward or from people, places, or things of the past or present. Christ in you is your releasing power now. Once. When I had fell bound to people and circumstances, I used these statements, and soon found myself moved into lovely new surroundings, free of old memories and possessions. Several people quickly moved out of my life and found their good elsewhere. People, places, and things responded to those statements of release. A possessive person often pours forth the substance of his thoughts and feelings into the life of someone else, so that he depletes himself emotionally and physically. Strong possessive emotional ties cause many of our problems, financial, health, and social. Declare often, I now release and am released from everything and everybody that are no longer part of the divine plan for my life. Everything and everybody that are no longer part of the divine plan for my life now release me. A businesswoman had been divorced for 20 years. She wished to remarry and felt she had met the man of her dreams, but he would not propose. She waited patiently for several years. Finally she talked over her problem with a friend, who said, there must be something from the past that needs to be forgiven and released, the friend then asked about her former husband. Oh, I have forgiven him for the unhappiness he caused me in the past, and he has remarried. But a strange thing happens. When my name is mentioned in his presence, he always becomes very negative and upset. Her friend said, that may be the block. Let's declare here and now that he forgives and releases you forever. These two women then sat quietly and called the former husband's name, declaring, The Christ in you forgives and releases me now and forever. Shortly thereafter, a stranger appeared in her office to inspect it. He became very interested in her personally, and began sending candy and flowers. She accepted his numerous dinner invitations. Her escort of several years standing did not like this. In fact, he quickly proposed, and they got married. But nothing had happened until she spoke words of forgiveness and release from her former husband. 
how to gain release from troublesome situations it is also wise to speak words of release for situations or problems that you have struggled with and have been unable to resolve these often respond quickly to this statement i release this situation these people to the perfect outworking of the christ consciousness now i now loose and let them go completely once when i had struggled with a complex human relations problem for weeks to no avail I released it to the Christ consciousness, which is the miracle consciousness, with the above words. This act gave me complete peace for the first time, and within a week the problem had quickly resolved itself in a way I could not have foreseen. A housewife was moving and needed a maid to help with the packing, but could not locate one. One afternoon, after she had struggled with packing all day, she finally said, Father, I release this packing and this move to you. I cannot handle it alone, so I place it in your hands. Then she retired and took a nap. An hour later she was awakened by the ringing telephone. A voice on the line said, This is Mary, your maid from two years ago. I suddenly had a feeling you might need me again. If so, I can come. Someone has said, Life is hard by the yard, by the inch, it's a cinch. Certainly when you daily practice forgiveness and release toward and from people, places, and things, you clear the channels for your good. Declare often, I am in right relationship with all people and all situations now. A woman's husband was in ill health, two of her children were struggling with unfortunate marriages, and she was struggling financially. Finally she said of all her problems, I now give them all to God. Of myself I can do nothing. Within a matter of days, new supply came. Within a few weeks, her husband's alarming health problems began to subside. And within a month, her children had straightened out their marriages. Releasios a businesswoman, in pain, limped into a prosperity lecture. There was a spur in her foot which her doctor had not been able to locate. He felt it would be better to let it work its way out rather than operate. During the lecture she learned of the healing power of release, and later that evening spoke words releasing her health problems to the father. Later in the night, she was awakened with a stab of pain from the affected fool. Examination revealed that the skin had opened, and the spur was breaking through. She was able to extricate it easily, and within a matter of hours she was walking normally again. Words of release had brought literal release of an unwanted condition in her body. Summary You can cleanse your mind for prosperity by 1. Realizing that cleansing or purification is the first step in prosperity. Without releasing mentally, emotionally, and in our visible world, there can be no permanent, satisfying prosperity. 2. In order to demonstrate true prosperity, you must get rid of what you do not want to make way for what you do want. 3. You can achieve this by forming an outer vacuum. By cleaning up and cleaning out the closets, drawers, file cabinets, desks, car, garage, etc. You make a believer out of your subconscious feeling nature, which then gets busy working with your conscious mind to cleanse your world for prosperity. 4. Form an outer vacuum also by affirming divine order and getting things in order generally, I am in divine order. My world is in divine order now. 5. Make a list of the things and conditions, even people, you want to eliminate from your life, both the tangibles and the intangibles. 6. Along with cleaning out the closets, clean up and clean out your life. The skeletons in the closet have got to go, if you wish to be truly prospered. 7. Practice forgiveness toward others. It's easier than you think. Do this by speaking words of forgiveness. 8. Declare that others forgive. Subconsciously they want to. 9. When you forgive your enemies, release your friends. You never lose anything through emotional release, you make way for the highest good of all concern to manifest without possessive domination or undue personal attachment. 10. Declare that others forgive you. Words of release clear up possessiveness and bondage when you decree that the Christ in the situation and in the people involved is the releasing power. 11. Also release situations or conditions you have been unable to resolve. This freedom often manifests in perfect solutions quickly. Chapter 3 Create Your Prosperity Mentally First In writing recently I lectured in New Orleans on the subject, You Can Have Everything. After the talk had begun, 
A businessman came rushing into the auditorium and said breathlessly to an usher, I hope I'm not too late, because I'm here to get everything. There is a way you can have everything and that is, by creating your good mentally first. It has been estimated that success may be as much as 98% mental, preparation and only 2% outer action. Jesus must have made a lot of mental preparation before feeding the 5,000, because he had them sit down in companies, look up, and give thanks first. There are three basic ways in which you may create your prosperity mentally first. 1. In writing. 2. In pictures. 3. In words. More than 10 years ago, when I began writing about prosperity, my son and I were living in one room. We might still be living in that one room if we had not begun creating our prosperity mentally first, by writing, picturing, and affirming it. It was while we were living in that room that I learned of these three ways to create prosperity mentally. When my son and I began to use them, they worked. This convinced me that I must begin telling other people about them through my writing. Stop looking to people or conditions for your prosperity. Start using these three simple prosperity techniques, as described in this and the following two chapters. As you do, you will create your prosperity mentally first. It will then overflow from the mental into the visible world as tangible results. For several years my son and I had been living in one room which had been provided to us by the church I was serving. The trustees seemed satisfied that they were adequately providing for us. The financial situation of the church at that time certainly did not seem equal to providing us with any more elaborate living quarters. Yet our present ones were certainly insufficient. Several times I had timidly mentioned it, but the feeling had always been the same. The church had no funds to provide us with a manse, period. On that note the subject was always closed. For many months I thought to myself resentfully, why doesn't somebody do something? Finally it occurred to me, why don't you do something? Why don't you create your prosperity mentally first? It was then that my young son and I decided to put into writing, picturing, and affirmation what we wanted, a church manse. After writing out our list, placing pictures on a treasure map, and beginning daily to speak forth the affirmation, I am beautifully and appropriately housed with the rich substance of God, an interesting thing happened. One day a man walked in, said he had just come into an inheritance, and wished to share the tithe from it with the church. How much is the tithing offering? I asked. Eight thousand dollars, he replied. Great. There's the down payment on the new church manse. Within a matter of days, a lovely house had been located in the most beautiful area of the city, and negotiations were quickly completed. Before we knew it, my son and I were moving into a new house with new furnishings. And just as quickly, perhaps as a bonus for all our prayer work, there appeared a fine housekeeper, who insisted she was going to work for us. She had read some of my writings and wanted to know more about prosperous thinking. It seemed a miracle, since domestic help was at such a premium and hardly within my financial reach under ordinary circumstances. As she foresaw, her personal contact with prosperous thinking proved worthwhile. She later resigned as my housekeeper and did what she had always dreamed of doing, she became a dressmaker, a profession in which she is still in demand. Why you must create your prosperity mentally first man is a spiritual and mental being, and lives from the inside out, through his mind. As a loving father, God is the source of your prosperity. This same father has provided the substance of the universe, which I like to call gold dust that you can shape and form as prosperity. This substance is passive and impersonal, and waits for you to form it personally as you will. You are master of the rich substance of the universe. You claim your mastery and take hold of this substance, shaping, molding, and forming it with your definite, deliberate thoughts, words, and actions. As you become definite about prosperity, it becomes definite for you. As you turn the great energy of your thinking upon ideas of plenty, you will have plenty, regardless of what people about you are saying or doing. It is through writing, picturing, and affirming prosperity that your thoughts, words, and actions begin working for you in happy, prosperous, productive ways. Begin right now to get definite about prosperity, by sitting down and making a list of the good you want to experience in your life. 
Emma Curtis Hopkins, a great truth teacher at the turn of the century, once said, Sit down at a certain time every day and write down on paper what your ideas of good are. You will find that such a practice will pin your mind down to the truth, and you will demonstrate results. Another eminent metaphysician, Dr. Emmett Fox, said that this is the way to alter your life. Remember this, if you just drift along without any decision or definite purpose, you become the helpless victim of circumstances. If your desires are not clear and definite, you become subject to the dominating personalities of people around you. The way to overcome difficulties is to set a goal in writing. Have you ever at some point in your life become subject to the dominant personality of someone who knew what he wanted, and found yourself getting it for him? One have. My son has always known what he wanted, in detail. Several years ago, I looked out the window and realized that the two sports cars I saw parked there were both the result of Richard's definite desires, not mine. I had never had any preference as to cars, but like most men, Richard had. The result was that not only was he driving a sports car equipped for racing, but so was I. Furthermore, remember this, if you do not know what you want and have no set purpose, your subconscious mind just produces a conglomeration of circumstances. This is why there is so much confusion in the lives of passive people. Concentrate on one thing long enough, and you are sure to get it. Always have a definite goal in mind and write it down. Never let yourself drift, unless you want to end up with two race cars parked in your yard. There is a specific reason why you should get definite about what you want. The word desire, in its root, means of the father. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom and it should be your good pleasure to receive it here and now. How can you test these desires to be sure they are of the Father? If the desires you have are only surface desires, they pass away, but if they are deep-seated desires for greater good that remain with you through thick and thin, they are from the Father. They are divine desires. You should express them constructively, rather than suppress them destructively. Desire is God trying to give you greater good. Open your mind to receive it. Then get definite about that desire by writing it down, so that it can definitely manifest for you. Choice is a magic word to the mind choice produces results. Your mind constantly produces what you choose. There is an ancient secret about the power of writing out what you want, as mentioned in my book The Prosperity Secret of the Ages, your definite written words dissolve all obstacles and barriers on the visible and invisible planes of life. Your written words go out into the ethers of this universe to work through people, circumstances, and events, to open the way for your desired good to come to pass. An artist proved this. She had an oil painting that had not been sold, after having been on display for months. Finally she remembered to write out, on her list of things desired, that this painting would sell quickly at the price she was asking. She wrote this on her list on October 11. On October 13 she received a long-distance call, informing her of an art show in a nearby city. The caller was requesting pictures from her to display at the show. She immediately sent the oil painting that was on her list, and it sold, as priced, the day the show opened. Psychologists tell us that most things are done by choice, that choice produces results, but that it is up to you to choose what you want. After I had written about this prosperity technique in my book, the dynamic laws of prosperity, a businessman from Philadelphia wrote me to verify the validity of this method. He was once asked by a large corporation to give 92 of their top executives a success course, for which the company paid him a large fee. In this course, the executives were asked to write out the things they wished to experience in life. The following results were reported, miracles happened. Everyone was healed of health problems, even of so-called incurable diseases. Out of 92 men, all but two said they had gained vast good. All of these men got raises in pay of from $2,000 to $20,000 a year. Health problems, prosperity and personality problems, were all solved by using this list-making method. The Psychology of Poverty Recently one of my readers, who is a psychologist, explained that the poor are so caught up in their present problems that they do not plan ahead or think ahead. Also. They have great hostility and envy toward those who prosper. The poor are suspicious and resentful toward people who succeed in life. What about you? 
Are you so wrapped up in problems of the past and the present that you have not taken time to plan for better things? Are you hostile and envious of people around you who succeed? Do you criticize them? Have you made unkind remarks about them? How do you feel, and how do you react, when someone near you has a prayer answered or has some good thing happen? Can you take it? Sometimes we are tested. Sometimes the good we desire in life seems to come to people around us first. If we can praise and give thanks for another's blessings, rather than be envious and jealous and critical, then we can be assured that those same blessings, or even greater ones, will come to us. But if we make unkind remarks about, are hostile toward, or are envious of other people's blessings, we have failed the test. We stop similar blessings from getting through to us. A statement you should use often to dissolve envy, hostility, jealousy, or criticism is this, love envieth not. The prospering truth has set me free. As you view the blessings that come to other people, remind yourself of this great truth, the longer your good is in coming, the greater it will be when it comes, so why envy anyone else his good? Indeed, when good things happen to other people, it is an indication that the same or even greater good can come to you. Make your list. Think about what you really want. When good things begin happening to people around you, it is an indication that your good is near. You can draw it to you, and externalize it quickly, by writing it down. An executive from Illinois once wrote me a long letter, in which he said, this business of writing a list of those things you feel you need in your life works. I have done just that and success became apparent almost instantly. Since then, everything I had on my list has come to me. Some of them were tremendous things, such as early retirement so that I might become a public speaker. I now am a lecturer for business groups at $250 per lecture. I also listed an adequate income, so that my life might continue normally as before retirement. Even such things as an expensive travel trailer, a fine motion picture camera, and other such items have come to me. I have proved beyond all doubt that God intends us to have whatever we want that will advance our good on this earth. Why this technique is necessary you may be thinking, yes, but why are these simple techniques necessary from a spiritual standpoint? The soul of man must look outward as well as inward for balance. The soul is the blending area of the mind. You must balance the inner with the outer. That is why you are in a body on this, earth plane, though you are a spiritual being functioning through a mind. There is nothing more pathetic than to see those misguided persons who think they are too advanced or too spiritual to demonstrate the blessings of life in a practical way. Such individuals become confused and suffer all kinds of needless problems because they are not balanced. Dare to do this simple thing, make your list of what you really want, not what somebody else thinks you should have. As you make your list, dare to please only yourself, remembering that the highest is the nearest. Then keep your list private, a secret between you and your own indwelling Lord. It is in this way that you express constructively, rather than suppress destructively, your desires, which are from the Father. The very act of list making clears your mind and your life. Recently I made a list of three things I thought I wanted to experience in my life. Six months later, when I looked at that list, I was amazed at how it had worked out. The first item on my list had come to pass. It was by far the most important one. The second item had not come to pass, and events indicated that the answer to that desire was no for the time being. So I dismissed it in peace, feeling that it would manifest later, at the right time. As I looked at the third desire, I realized I had changed my mind completely and simply did not want it, and it had not taken place. You can test this method by first using it on a daily basis. A young insurance executive said, I have bogged down. I now sell more than a million dollars worth of insurance each year and am a member of the President's Club. But I want to sell at least two million dollars worth of insurance this next year, and go on up from there. I suggested that he begin going to the office an hour earlier each morning, before his secretary arrived and the telephone started ringing. In that early morning hour, he was to write out a list of the things he wanted to accomplish that day. At the top of his daily list he was to write, The success power of Jesus Christ is in absolute control of this day. 
producing perfect results here and now. A week later he telephoned, it works. I can hardly believe how much has been accomplished this week, easily and peacefully. In one day alone, I sold two $50,000 policies, and now I have an appointment to make the biggest sale of my life. I am well on the way to my $2 million goal for this year. He had outlined to me his five-year plan for success, which included an increase from $2 million in sales to $3 million, $4 million and $5 million, with additional employees being added to his staff from time to time. I suggested that he work up the five-year plan on a poster board, and place it where he could look at it in his early morning quiet time. This he had done. Are you willing to take what goes with results? After making your list, be ready and willing to change it, as the days pass and as your mind goes to work for you. Be flexible. Be adaptable. Be willing to expand and improve your list. It is wise to make three lists. 1. What you want to eliminate from your life. 2. What you want to bring into your life. 3. What you are thankful for. After making these lists, Ask yourself the following questions, first, are these desires legal? Would they hurt anyone else if they came to pass? There is an old saying, the good of one is the good of all, second, are these desires emotionally right for you? Are you emotionally ready to accept them if they come? Third, are you willing to accept the responsibility that goes with having them? Fourth, what are you going to give up to make room for them? In his famous essay on compensation, Immersion explained, for everything you gain, you lose something. Every phase of life requires renunciation. Every advance means the rejection of something old. A mother was anxious for her 30-year-old son to marry. Though a well-educated and prosperous professional man, he was crippled. Both he and his mother feared he might never marry. After taking some prosperity classes, she decided to write on her list the desire for her son to marry. Almost immediately, he met the girl of his dreams, who did not care that he was lame. But his dream girl had been married before and had several children. This his mother had not counted on, nor was she emotionally prepared to cope with all that went with giving up her son. They had lived together for years, and she had grown accustomed to his company, as well as his financial help with her various interests. When she realized what would happen if her son did marry, she tore up her list but it was too late. He was well on the way to matrimony. His mother never forgave the list-making method for working too well. She refused to believe that elimination not only takes something from you, but also gives something to you, if you let it. Unfortunately, she never let it work in this perfect way. Buddha taught that each man is free, that he is the maker of his own destiny through his choices, but that in making his choices he must be willing to accept the consequences. I recently looked at a list I made, month by month, for a 12-month period 10 years ago. It was gratifying to realize that everything I had asked for on those lists had come to be, not always in the way I had anticipated, but manifest they did. There were surprises that accompanied some of them, even changes in residents and ministries, accompanied by moves to new parts of the country, were occasioned by some items on the list. After completing your list, you can protect your desires by writing at the bottom, this or something better, Father. Let your unlimited goodwill be done. Or, I release my list to the perfect outworking of the Christ consciousness now. This opens the way for your highest good to come to you. Summary 1. You can create your prosperity mentally first in writing. 2. The reason you should do so is this. If you just drift along without any definite purpose, you become the helpless victim of circumstances. If your desires are not definite, you become subject to the dominating personalities of people around you. The way to overcome difficulties is to set a goal in writing. 3. The psychology of the poor shows that they do not use this technique. They are so caught up in their present problems that they do not think ahead or plan ahead. 4. The poor usually feel much hostility and envy toward those who succeed in life. 5. Are you hostile or envious toward people around you who succeed? Can you take their success? 6. If you can praise and give thanks for another's blessings, you open the way for those same blessings, or greater ones, to come to you. 7. Write out what you really want, not what somebody else wants you to have. 
8. It is wise to make three lists, what you want to eliminate from your life, what you want to manifest in your life, and what you're thankful for. 9. Ask yourself these questions, are these desires spiritually sound? Are these desires emotionally right for me? Am I willing to accept the responsibility that goes with the fulfillment of these desires? What am I going to give up, to make room for them? 10. After making your list, keep quiet about it, bless it, and release its perfect outworking to the Father. 11. In this way you express constructively, rather than suppress destructively, your desires which are from the Father. Chapter 4 The Secret of Permanent Prosperity By now, your gold dust formula for prosperity is becoming clear. First, you cleanse your mind for prosperity. Second, you create your prosperity, mentally, in writing, pictures, and words. These are all ways of opening your mind to prosperity and receiving it. But there is still another way to give your prosperity a permanent, enduring basis. This is the most fascinating and mystical prosperity law of all. The ancients knew about it, and practiced it as ten, the magic number of increase. They invoked the number of increase through systematic tithing or returning to their gods a tenth of their game, crops, and other channels of income. The word tithe means tenth. People of all great civilizations have felt that ten was the magic number of increase, and have invoked it by tithing. These included the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians, Arabians, Greeks, Romans, and Chinese. In modern times, the magic number of increase still can be invoked through the act of consistent tithing. A housewife in Southern California learned she could tithe her way to prosperity, and decided to try it. She and her husband had seven growing children, for whom they had struggled financially even though her husband worked for one of the major television studios. After she began to tie their current income, an opportunity opened for some of her children to appear in television commercials. For this they were well paid. As they tithed from this income, the way opened for all her children to do television commercials, from which they received handsome residuals. They continued to tithe from all channels of income and within two years this family had moved into a lovely $60,000 home, the husband had received a better job, and all the children were working in their spare time on television. Trust funds have now been set up for the children's education, and their future seems assured financially. A friend said, doing television commercials is such competitive work that I don't see how your children have done so well. The average actor feels lucky to get two or three jobs a year doing commercials, yet your children have appeared in 30 this past year. The mother explained, 10 is the magic number of increase. We tithe all channels of income, so it isn't strange that our children would receive 10 times as much work as those actors who don't tithe. It is the prosperity law. Tithing, a millionaire's formula as the Bible's first millionaire. Abraham learned this success secret from the Babylonians, who were among the most prosperous people of the past. The Babylonians first advocated savings, home ownership, insurance, and other sound financial practices. Abraham passed along the tithing law of prosperity to his grandson Jacob, who included it in his success covenant. God later gave Moses specific instructions about tithing for the Hebrews. As long as the people of the Old Testament tithed, they prospered. But when they no longer put God first financially, during the reign of Solomon, the kingdom divided and the children of Israel went into Babylonian exile. When the remnant returned to Jerusalem, the prophet Malachi reminded them they must again tithe if they wished to prosper. He promised that the windows of heaven would open to them if they again invoked ten as the magic number of increase. In the New Testament, both Jesus and Paul were tithers. It was a required temple practice. As a Jew, Jesus paid tithes. A Pharisee in Jesus' time was required to spend a fourth of his income for religious giving. Paul was both a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. From his youth, he had been required to give a fourth of his income to God. Tithing was a household word in Bible times. The ancients intuitively knew that giving, sharing, and putting God first financially was the first step to permanent, enduring prosperity. You can tithe your way out of indebtedness The act of tithing, 
or giving back to God's work a tenth of one's gross income, is not something that some minister dreamed up as a means of raising money. It is a universal prosperity law, practiced throughout the centuries as a method of prospering. People on a permanent basis. When you give consistently to God's work, you open the way to receive consistently in your own. Many people have had a psychological block against tithing, because so many theologians have stressed what tithing would do for the church rather than what it would do for the individual. When you look up the great tithing promises in the Bible, such as that given by Malachi, you find that the Bible says that the individual who tithes will be prospered. It goes without saying that his church will be, too. But that is secondary, and not the primary cause for tithing. As Ellie Meyer wrote, as you tithe, so you prosper. When you cannot afford to tithe perhaps you are thinking, but I cannot afford to tithe. Then you cannot afford not to tithe. The greater the present financial necessity, the greater the need for immediately invoking 10, the magic number of increase. A businesswoman was in a financial bind. She had moved from one part of the country to another, and had gone into a new line of work. It was paying off, but not fast enough to meet her many expenses. She practiced all the laws of prosperity in an effort to demonstrate immediate cash. Nothing happened, until she remembered she had gotten careless about her tithing. She sat down and wrote out a tithe check for $50, and mailed it. The next day she got additional calls for work that tided her over a period of financial strain. But nothing had happened until she first tithed. Many years ago I began tithing, at a time when I felt I could not afford to tithe, yet could not afford not to, since my financial needs were so great. I decided to test 10, the magic number of inquiries, after reading the following account of how someone even more destitute than I had been prospered through tithing. A man who was $10,000 in debt, with his credit gone and a wife and four children to provide for, took a job as a day laborer in a mill, and with his family was compelled to live in a tent. He met two divinity students who convinced him that if he wanted to prosper again, he should tithe. The same week he began tithing, the company offered him one of its houses in which to live. Within a year he was promoted to foreman. Ten years later he was free from debt the owner of a flourishing lumber company, a luxury car, an airplane, and other things on a similar scale. He attributes his success to first recognizing his debt to God and then faithfully tithing his income. I decided to try this prosperity formula of tithing, and it worked for me also. Tithing your time isn't enough a woman said, I don't see why I should tithe my money. I tithe my time to God's work. I am a Sunday school teacher. I replied. That's fine, but what are you trying to demonstrate? More time or more money? Oh, I'd like to have more time, but I really need more money. I suggested that she check out the tithing promises in the Bible. They all spoke of tithing money and financial assets. Nowhere does the Bible talk about tithing one's time. A woman in Florida learned about tithing, and began to tithe from her small retirement income. Immediately she was offered part-time work and accepted it tithing from it. Then she realized that the Bible spoke of tithing a tenth of everything. She had a savings account with $5,000 in it, and decided that she should tithe from that as well. She then drew $500 out of her savings account, and gave it to the church where she had learned about the great law of tithing. Soon it she heard from the local social security board, asking that she come in and see them. Her first reaction was one of fear, now what have I done wrong? But upon visiting them she had a pleasant surprise. Rather apologetically, they said, we owe you some money. Because of a new government regulation, the fact that you were born before a certain date means that we owe you $1,250. She said, I'm getting a social security check every month, thank you. Yes, we know that, and you will continue doing so. Nevertheless, we owe you this additional sum. After the necessary paperwork was completed, she received a check. Another tither wondered why her savings account did not seem to grow. First she would put money in it, and then take money from it. Finally it dawned on her that she was not tithing from the interest on that account. As she began tithing on interest income, her savings began to grow steadily. Similarly, 
Another tither worried because his investments did not seem to prosper him as they should, until he realized he was tithing from other channels of income but had never tithed from his stocks. After tithing from his stock income, he felt guided to sell certain of his stocks and invest in others, which brought him a far more handsome income. This man no longer worries about the ups and downs of the stock market, but feels that, with God as his financial partner, he will continue to be guided about his income from this channel. He continues to prosper. Withholding the tithe brings luck Robert Latorno, the engineering genius, became famous for his tithing. In his book, Mover of Men and Mountains, he speaks of the time after he started tithing when business was so good that one year he decided to hold on to his tithe, God, we have had a good year. Instead of giving you your tithe of $100,000, which the business owes you this year, I am going to reinvest that $100,000 in the business, and you will get that tithe and much more next year. He suffered one financial reverse after another. Bad weather kept his construction work from going forward. At the end of the year, he was $100,000 in debt. He learned from that experience never to withhold the tithe, and never to try to bargain with God about it. In reflecting upon the lesson he learned, he quipped, It is all right to give God credit, but he can also use cash. Later Latorno's tithes ran into the millions, and he had to form a private foundation just to handle the distribution of them. A salesman had prospered so much through tithing that he was trying to convince the owner of his company to tithe from company income. He wanted to know what to say to the boss. A friend suggested he remind his boss that many of this country's millionaires attribute their wealth to tithing, the Rockefellers, the Heinz people, the Quaker Oats people, the Kraft people. Tithing is a tried and true method in business. Where you give is important it is important that you give where you are receiving spiritual help and inspiration. A woman once said, I have some apartments that I cannot keep rented although I use all the prosperity laws. And don't tell me to tithe, because I'm already doing that. Where are you tithing? I can't see that it is important where I tithe, so I give my tithe to the church I used to attend. But I now attend where I get far. More inspiration. The answer was, tithe where you are getting your help and inspiration if you wish to be prospered. It is inconsistent to do otherwise. To get spiritual help from one place and tithe to another is like going to one doctor for help and trying to pay another, or like eating in one restaurant, yet paying for your meal in another. Giving where you are receiving spiritual help and inspiration keeps you in touch with the flow of supply. Tithing heals a woman started tithing for financial reasons and was prospered, but she had a surprise. For years she had tried to lose weight and had been unable to do so. Yet when she started tithing, she tithed away 15 pounds. Tithing helps free you from the negative experiences of life. A woman who is now in the millionaire bracket said, When something negative happens to me, I know I have not given enough. A negative experience is always an indication to me to give. I ask, Father, what do I need to give? There is one basic problem in life, congestion. There is one basic solution, circulation. If your financial affairs have stagnated into indebtedness, hard times, and constant problems, you can clear up the congestion through beginning to trust God to help you, through your act of tithing to Him. Tithing is an act of faith that brings about circulation and dissolves congestion. A man in New York City wrote, My first tithe took away a strange circulatory ailment which defied medical help. Then he made a confession. It took me three years to change my thinking so that I was able to tithe. I had always skipped the chapters on tithing in your books. Now I am dumbfounded by the immediate disappearance of that constant, dreadful pain in my right leg and foot, thanks to giving the first tithe of my life. A man in the real estate business in Southern California got careless in the distribution of his tithes, and learned quite a lesson. One month he gave his tithe to a problem-prone relative rather than giving it to his church. Everything went wrong. His bank account got mixed up, and a number of checks bounced. A real estate deal, from which he expected a commission of several thousand dollars, did not go through. Other channels of supply simply dried up, and he was left in a financial bind. 
everything stagnated until he again put God, and not a problem prone relative, first financially. There is nothing wrong in giving to one in need, if you are careful what you give. But by giving only money, you offer only temporary help and therefore keep him in poverty. It is far wiser to give him literature on how to use the laws of prosperity for himself. This will prosper him permanently, and make him independent of poverty programs or handouts. The ancient laws on tithing were very definite about where the tithe was to be given. The first tenth went to the priests and place of worship. This tithe was given impersonally. The giver had no say about how it was to be spent. The second tithe was a festival tithe, the third, a charity tithe. If you are giving several tenths of your income, rather than only one tenth, then you may feel freer with your second and third tithe. But your first tithe should be given impersonally to God's work, with no stipulation as to how it is to be spent by the recipient. Where you give your money is where you give your faith A woman who had long been in ill health gave her money generously to several medical funds, yet could not understand why the prayers of her minister and prayer group had not healed her. She had not identified financially with her church and its prayers for her. She had identified financially with heart trouble, cancer, polio, and many of the world's ills, through her giving. That was where she gave her money, and that was where her faith was. She needed to go all the way with God in her giving, if she wanted God to go all the way in healing her. There are plenty of people in the world today who have no spiritual faith or religious affiliation, yet want to give. Perhaps it is a step forward for them to support medical funds. They need to be giving and that is the level of their understanding, so that is the level of their giving. But the sooner you evolve out of that level to a more expanded level of giving, to those people and organizations that inspire and uplift mankind spiritually, the sooner you will help mankind find the truth that heals and prospers. If the truth movement were properly supported, its teaching would reach millions, through the mass media, and wipe out disease and poverty. Emmett Fox put it succinctly, the truth movement is the only thing that can save the world from its ills. Everything else has already been tried. The Internal Revenue Service allows you to tithe up to half of your adjusted income. A lawyer who tithes a tenth of his legal income, before expenses, has said, If I don't give it to God's work, I've got to give it in taxes. Since I do not get to keep it, I prefer to give it where it will help and spiritually inspire many people. This man has prospered incredibly. Sometimes people ask, Should I tithe gross or net? A friend said, I tried tithing net, after taxes, but found I never had money enough to pay my taxes. When I went all the way with God, and tithed gross, before taxes, there was always money to pay my taxes. Tithing gross took the strain off my financial affairs all the way around. If you are not free to tithe from all channels of income, start tithing from one channel. If you do not feel guided to tithe gross, begin tithing net. The important thing is to begin invoking 10, the magic number of increase, in some way. Expanded results will justify expanded giving. History shows that the ancient Egyptians gave 20%, or two tithes, to their temples. The Hebrews gave four tithes, even after they were required to pay taxes to the Roman government, in New Testament times. The Hindus required their people to give a tenth unless they were poor. They required the poor to tithe two-tenths, because they felt the poor needed to give more in order to expand their prosperity consciousness. I once had a large lithe offering I had not released. Someone telephoned to say she was sending me a valuable gift. It was something I had wanted for a long time. But weeks, then months, passed, and I did not receive that gift. Finally I asked for guidance as to why the gift had not arrived, and the thought came. You have not given that tithe offering yet. You've got to give to make room to receive. Release that tithe. Turn it loose quickly and completely. I did. On that same day, in a distant city, my long-promised gift was put in the mail to me, with this note, the strangest thing happened. After I telephoned you that I was sending your gift, it disappeared. For weeks I looked for it and could not find it. Finally, just this morning, it reappeared and I am quickly sending it on to you as promised. I apologize for the delay. That was a tremendous prosperity lesson to me. 
When you do not give, you do not receive. When you withhold the tithe, your good may even get lost. Giving is the first step in receiving. Furthermore, when you do not give voluntarily to the constructive experiences of life, you will have to give involuntarily to the destructive experiences of life. But give you must. It is the law of the universe. Sometimes that law works rather quickly. A woman once said, I don't attend your lectures anymore, because the last time I did, as I was leaving the building afterward, someone snatched my purse. It was interesting that, of all the people in attendance, this woman's purse was the only one that was taken. She had always said to the ushers at offering time, I don't have an offering. I forgot my wallet. In turn, she experienced a quick working of the law. She also proved that if you try to get something for nothing, something is taken from you. Something for nothing is still nothing. When something is taken from you, it is an indication that you have not given, or have not given enough. One woman said, I cannot understand it. I've been greatly prospered through my study of the prosperity laws, even to the point of independent wealth, but I cannot keep it. People keep robbing me of my money. I make them loans of money as a means of helping them, but they never pay me back. I could take them to court and collect, but I want to get my money peacefully. The reply was, you say you have used all the prosperity laws. That means you tithe. Oh, no. How can I lithe, with all these people robbing me? It was suggested that she study the third chapter of Malachi, which plainly points out that when you rob God, man robs you. When you stop robbing God and begin putting him first financially, then other people will stop robbing you. She had reversed the law, and she was getting a reversed result. A millionaire businessman did not believe this. He had made his fortune the hard way, through his own blood, sweat, and tears, as well as through that of others. He refused to pay his employees well. He paid all his help the lowest possible price. He bought everything at a bargain and for many years he seemed to get by with it. Then one day it boomeranged on him in a way he would not have believed. His most prized possession was his beautiful wife. Suddenly another man appeared on the scene and took her from him. He had unwittingly fulfilled the words of Malachi, You are cursed with a curse, for you all but robbed me. Tithing brings good in all phases of your life. A businessman in Detroit began tithing, and had a surprise. He was immediately relieved of his job of long standing. This was a job he never had liked. This man then tithed from his unemployment check, and went on to a $20,000 a year job, from which he continues to tithe. At the time he tithed from his unemployment checks, he also was enduring an unhappy marriage. That dissolved. He found that putting God first financially, through tithing, straightened out every phase of his life. He explained to a friend. When I began tithing, limitation turned me loose. Money invested in spiritual things is never lost, rather, it is multiplied many times over. Summary The secret of permanent prosperity includes, 1. Using the number 10 as the magic number of increase. The word 10 means tithe. 2. From primitive times, people of all great civilizations have practiced tithing as the universal law of prosperity. 3. Systematic giving opens the way to systematic receiving. 4. Tithing, giving, and sharing are always the first steps to permanent, enduring financial increase. 5. Many of our modern millionaires have proved it. Abraham, the Bible's first millionaire, tithed. As long as the people of the Old Testament tithed, they prospered. It was when they no longer put God first financially that their nation divided and they went into exile. When the remnant returned from exile, the prophet Malachi reminded them they must again tithe if they wished to prosper. Both Jesus and Paul were tithers, it was a required temple practice in their time. 6. The greater the present financial need, the greater the need to tithe. 7. Tithing your time isn't enough. The Bible promises prosperity to those who tithe a tenth of all channels of income. This includes tithing from savings accounts, stocks, real estate, and inheritance. 8. Tithing heals, because it is an act of faith that brings about circulation and dissolves congestion. 9. Where you give is important. Tie the tenth of your gross income at the point or points where you are receiving spiritual help and inspiration. 
give it impersonally, with no strings attached. Giving to needy relatives or in other personal ways is not tithing. 10. When you do not give voluntarily to the constructive experiences of life, you will have to give involuntarily to the destructive experiences of life. Give you must. It is the law of the universe tie the tenth of all channels of income. This includes tithing from savings accounts, stocks, real estate, and inheritance. 8. Tithing heals, because it is an act of faith that brings about circulation and dissolves congestion. 9. Where you give is important. Tie the tenth of your gross income at the point or points where you are receiving spiritual help and inspiration. Give it impersonally, with no strings attached. Giving to needy relatives or in other personal ways is not tithing. 10. When you do not give voluntarily to the constructive experiences of life, you will have to give involuntarily to the destructive experiences of life. Give you must. It is the law of the universe.